So when Nats 2.0 was being designed um, around this, this abstract goal of connecting everything, right? Um, with large scale global topologies, uh, security models, multi-tenancy, things like that. Um, when we actually launched it, it was kind of interesting. There was um, some tooling that uh, the team had written and some that I had written that um, were just utility applications that we would spin up and uh, again, query uh, state within our global network, NGS, which some of you have had a chance to look at and play with. Um, and what I found was we were going into holiday break. Um, we had just launched it. All of us were dead tired from uh, launching at KubeCon and I think it was 2018, 19, not sure. Um, but I noticed that, you know, with our very forward looking security, which I think is a good thing, um, what I was starting to experience was this notion of, wow, it takes a while for the utility to come up, establish a TLS connection to a dynamic DNS entry, um, do the um, notch challenge key exchange, the, the JWTs and all that we are part of NATS 2.0's security model. And so going into to holiday, um, you know, I, I started thinking about, hey, how can we kind of fix this? Maybe, maybe there's something that's missing. And so leaf nodes were kind of born out of hey, I want to try to solve this one specific problem of, of amortization of the security and TLS constructs and set up. What happened though over that break and subsequently with a lot of input from a lot of the NATS ecosystem and, and um, the NATS maintainers and, and team members uh, at Stenadia was that it was kind of the, the missing topology link um, that we, we needed. Um, and so what I mean by that is, um, NATS already has multiple server connection topologies. And what I mean by that is, is a connection topology is I'm speaking specifically about how servers talk to other servers. Um, almost 10 years ago when NATS was uh, originally created, it was a single server, right? It was a, let's get this thing up and running and, and, and go forward in terms of some of the stuff we were trying to do at the time with Cloud Foundry. Um, and then we quickly introduced the notion of a route, which is um, a cluster, right? It forms a cluster of, of servers. and it's akin to what most people consider distributed systems today, which means, yes, there's multiple components working, um, but there's a, an underlying assumption, which is a, a bias and maybe not necessarily a good one that says, well, I assume that the signal noise is pretty good, the RTT is pretty good, and the bandwidth is pretty decent, meaning I can run inside of a region or availability zone in a cloud type stuff, but if you want to really stretch me out, that doesn't really work very well. And most of the distributed systems that are in our language today, um, you know, Kubernetes and Kafka um, are like that. They don't like to be stretched from East Coast to West Coast or to Asia Pac or to Europe. And to be frank, you know, NATS was the same way with its um, initial clustering algorithms. And so in NATS 2.0, right, we introduced the second topology of how you can connect servers together called gateways, which are extremely tolerant of, of very a long RTT, low bandwidth, spotty connections, um, low signal to noise type of scenarios. Leaf Notes then uh, joins that group of, of um, connection topologies that says, hey, this can actually be a hub and spoke. So you can treat something that looks like a NAT cluster or a super cluster or even a single server as a hub, and you can actually drive spokes as many as you want. You can daisy chain them together um, to your heart's content. And so leaf nodes specifically introduced that topology change uh, or topology addition, I apologize. Um, but they also do something that's, that's really interesting, which is they allow us to bridge operator and security domains. And this one is um, very subtle and nuanced, but it's extremely important for a lot of the new things that you're seeing today from the WebSocket support uh, to MQTT stuff that we'll be talking about a little bit later on. Um, where I can say, hey, I want to have a shared utility, either inside of a company, an organization, or like uh, Sinead is trying to do, a global you know, shared utility, but I also want people to be able to extend it to meet their own demands and, and have servers that they're gonna run and operate, and they might change security mechanisms on those domains. And again, if we've already seen a little bit of this. It wasn't necessarily um, obvious, but, WebSockets has a slightly different security domain where they're treating JWTs that are handed out as bear tokens versus public claims. MQTT has its own security model, right? And so 
this, this property of a leaf note will allow us to do some very, very interesting things where you can mix and match utility SaaS with owned and operated, even inside of individual companies um, where companies struggle to go from lots of silos of technologies to someone raises their hand and say, well, what we really need is a shared utility. All of us can share the same Kafka cluster. Um, and, and a lot of times those technologies struggle at, at taking on that identity. Um, and we've put in a lot of hard work and the ecosystem has been amazing in, in helping us out to try to realize all of those other pieces that needed to be in play to get to where we are now. Um, and it's interesting because the security model, even though you can change the security domain, the security model is um, cohesive and it's the same one all the way throughout. And I'll kind of show that in a, in a quick little demo of what I mean. Um, a single server can have lots of leaf node connections and I'll show that as well. And leaf nodes can be daisy chained together, right? So we've had certain people say, oh, I'm gonna run a central hub, but I wanna have lots and lots of connections. And these were actually um, out to, let's say, web or mobile. And of course, now we have web sockets that can secure that. But that could be a very legitimate architecture of a single server cluster or super cluster that then has lots of hub and spokes to actually take on all of the inbound clients from uh, a mobile application or a web application. Um, and so they're very, very versatile. Um, we've noticed that most of the large POCs we've been doing um, today, um, we're using them in almost every single one. So I think of it as the best of both worlds, you know, uh, multiple operators, multiple security domains, mixing shared utility with owned and operated. It's not a, a, an or conversation, it's an and. You can do both at the same time. Um, and so we're really excited about where they are. They're still early on and we're still, you know, really trying to work with lots of different users and, and um, uh, people working in the ecosystem to utilize these in ways that we might not have thought of. So it's been a great progress uh, for the last, uh, I'd say three to six months. So again, a leaf node, we start with the notion that at least from uh, the original NATS 2.0, uh, where a NAT system can be a single server, can be a cluster, again, maybe on a per region basis, or a super cluster, which is the way we connect clusters of clusters that Wally demonstrated when he was talking about some of the Kubernetes stuff and the Helm 3 updates that we were doing. And so what happens is, is that now leaf nodes can extend that. And it's a traditional hub and spoke type of, of scenario. And here we can see we actually have three different servers. And what again is very interesting, just about even the simple diagram, is, is that, you know, this again could be a single server cluster, super cluster. This can be a single server or a small cluster. It doesn't have to be a singleton, right? And, and thanks to Ari, who I know I think is, is getting some well-deserved sleep now since, since he's uh, in the European time zone, um, pushed us early on to say, hey, I want to have a small cluster and I don't want to have a single gateway and leader elections and single points of failure. And so this model right here, where every single one of those NAT servers is configured exactly the same way to solicit a connection to the NAT supercluster, right, in the middle, um, work and work independently. They self-heal themselves independently. And so there is no single point of failure in that type of a setup. So we think that is extremely powerful as well. Now, what's interesting is, is that we can mix and match the notion of accounts. Um, and so... For those that, that don't know, accounts is kind of how we quantify the notion of multi-tenancy in a system. Um, by default, all the users inside of an account can see each other and talk to each other, but by default, they cannot talk to anyone else inside of another account. Now, of course, we, we allow secure sharing, and, and you can read a lot more about that. I think it's one of the most powerful things we've done with being able to build out um, systems where there's separation of concerns and organizations and business functions all operating very seamlessly. But what's interesting here is, is that the fact that the, the NAT supercluster has multiple accounts, let's say A, B, and C, doesn't necessarily mean that the clients that would connect to these leaf node servers have to be aware of that, right? They can actually not even expose accounts at all underneath the covers utilizing the global account, their own security domain, which I'll, again, I'll demo here in, in a quick second. Um, but what they'll do is as they connect in, they will use very strong high-level NATS 2.0 security, TLS, nonce challenges, ED25519 signage of uh, public claims to prove who this is, but that's all oblivious to all of the clients that are connected here. Yet once it's inside of here, it's bound to let's say account A, B, or C. And so if someone over here is also binding to account, let's say B, any client over here can talk to any client over here totally transparently, regardless of how big this 
supercluster is. And that means it can span multiple geos, multiple cloud providers, edge gateways, every, everything uh, you can imagine. Now, leaf nodes, again, bind to these hub accounts, and I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, it's, it's, it takes a while to wrap your head around it, and, and we're uh, becoming more aware of that. But once the light bulb kind of goes off, and when I show you how simple the configuration is, it becomes extremely powerful. Um, account A can also have uh, credentials, and a local account can be, you know, again, global or bound to an account, which I'll show you. And again, the security domain and how you want to exercise that can change so that the security model here is very different than here. But again, it's the same technology. It's the same thing that can be trusted end to end. And so a demo, I'm going to stop sharing for a quick second and then reshare right away for my, uh, my terminal, but I think I'll do my whole desktop. Okay, can you guys see the terminal? Yep. Yes, okay, good. Uh, this is a live demo, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. But what I'm gonna show is I'm gonna show you, I wanna run a local NAT server, and I'm gonna connect this to uh, our supercluster, right? Our NGS supercluster. And those who receive the email um, with the offer to get a free lifetime um, business level account, thousands of connections, um, leaf node connections, all that stuff, and have gone through this, um, you guys are welcome to follow along at home and you'll see exactly what, what I'm going to see. So before I do this, um, you know, I'm going to go here and I'm going to say, I want to send a request into NGS. Um, I'm going to send it into a service that I've imported that'll tell me my usage. And so this might look like um, something like this. Now Nats NGS is an alias for me that just says point to NGS and use my credentials, Derek's credentials. So it's just a shorthand. I'll show you what that looks like. And so I say, I'm sending a request, meaning I want a response, I'm sending it to ngs.usage and give me my usage for the last 24 hours. And so you can see a simple JSON response that says, okay, this is what you're doing. Now what's interesting is, and it's nuanced and it's not specific to leaf nodes, but I wanted to point it out is what the system is doing is, is that every user of the system has NGS usage as an imported subject that I can send messages to. But the back end, which resides in a totally different account, and there's a secure handshake in between my account and the usage accounts and the uh, applications that are doing the responses here, it actually is listening on ngs.usage.star and you have to get a token permission to import it. And what it's done is it's only given me permission to import ngs.usage.mypublicngs account ID. Yet because of the way I import that service, I can put it wherever I want. I put it in NGS usage. So now all of a sudden, everyone has the same experience. Everyone who has an NGS account can do the, the same thing I'm kind of doing here. Uh, and again, if you want to look at the alias, uh, it's right here. So I'm just doing a uh, NATS utility that um, RI talked about earlier using this server, these credentials, and then of course it passes on that stuff. Um, so again, interesting, but you notice it's a little slow, right? It's taking a little while to kind of get going. Um, now, if I wanted to use the local one, uh, this is the underlying um, uh, request from the NATS utility, again, that Ari was talking about. Um, it uh, typed in request twice, sorry. Uh, it'll say there's no servers. There's nothing going on here, right? And so what I want to do is I want to create a local server. And I want this thing to transparently but securely bind into NGS, but I can have clients just connect to this. And so I'm now owning and operating this server, even though Synadia and, and others are operating uh, NGS. Um, and I might want to change my security domain, which I actually do, because I'm going to say, hey, only applications that are running on this, on this machine can get access to it. So I don't need TLS. I don't need a user password or any type of authentication. At least for me, I'm comfortable with that, right? The security in terms of the machine. And so to show you what that would look like, uh, this is it. Uh, and so we're saying, hey, we want to solicit a leaf node connection. We're going to solicit it from a remote that is residing here. This is a DNS setup that, that Dave and others will talk about later about how we do geo pinning and cloud provider affinity and stuff, which is stuff we're happy to share with everyone on how we did that. Here's my credentials, which you saw from the alias. If you follow the instructions in the email um, and you actually use the Nats Connect um, as both the account and the default user, uh, meaning you followed the the uh, email exactly, 
you just put this in instead of what I'm doing right here. And so I can now go over here and say, hey, I want to run a NAT server and I'm going to connect it to or use the leaf.conf, which we just looked at as my configuration. And so if you notice, it immediately said, yep, I'm connected to ngs.global now. And what's happening is, is that on the NGS side, everything that's coming and going looks like Derek's account. And everything over here is just, there's no authentication, authorization, TLS, it's just an open port. So now all of a sudden, let me see if I can hide this thing. I've got a little bar that keeps getting in my way from Zoom that won't let me, uh, here we go, I'll just do it this way. So now if I do this, I do have a server that's locally running and this returns. And if you noticed, hopefully you did, it seemed very fast, right? Because we've amortized all of the cost of TLS and all of the, the um, complexities around um, the key exchange, the non-signing, all the stuff that NATS 2.0 does uh, to try to make a uh, extremely secure, forward-looking secure, secure by default system with NGS, where NGS never has access to any of my private keys or passwords ever. So now all of a sudden this becomes very interesting, right? I, I now have the ability to own and operate my own server or a small cluster of servers, and I'm using a shared utility. And so if I started talking amongst myself just on my, my local computer here, um, no traffic would ever move to NGS whatsoever. I'm you know, listening on Foo and sending to Foo. It's just using my own local server to do that. So this best of both worlds topology is kind of interesting to us. Now, what's interesting as well is, is again, we talked about the fact that even though this one is um, super simple, we can do multiple accounts. Um, and so what I'm doing here is, is now I'm saying, okay, now my local server does have multiple accounts, A and B, and it has the ability to do um, authentication, right? Just simple user password. Um, we're still soliciting the connection into NGS, we're still being represented by Derek, so it's in the Derek account when it shows up over there. But locally, we're going to bind to account A, which means that if someone's still logged into account A, it flows to this TLS connection into the leaf node. If it's on account B, it does not. And so let's see kind of really quickly what that might look like. Um, so you can see that I've connected again to the leaf node, you will see again, hopefully that this will not work, right? It'll say there's an authorization violation, um, A colon A. Um, now, if I say I want to publish to my local uh, server, but using the A.A, .A, meaning I'm a part of the A account, this should work, um, which does well. And again, if I do, uh, let's see if I can find, uh, here we go. Now, if I'm doing a NATS request, again, using my local server, but I'm logging in as A, meaning I'm bound to account A, and I'm doing the NGS usage thing, this works exactly as it did up here. But if I go and I say, hey, I want to be part of BB, and again, accounts by default isolate all traffic. So this server is, is truly multi-tenant now with all of the users of account B and all of the users of account A. But when I do this, it'll stall and just time out because there's no rule to propagate that information to uh, NGS through that leaf node. Now, of course, we can also say, um, now I'm gonna say I have, again, two accounts locally, A and B, and I'm actually going to create multiple leaf node connections bound to the different local accounts. This one's gonna bind to Derek, and this one's gonna bind to an OSCON account that um, we set up for OSCON, Wally and I did when we did our talks and demos up there. And so if I go back and I restart the server, but I use now two, you'll see it has two connections now. And by the way, if you really want to see what's going on, you can always add DB in um, and it'll start showing you lots of stuff, interaction with the leaf nodes, sending the credentials, all of the things that are going back and forth. Leaf nodes are the only network topology that NATS has that is interest only both ways. Uh, so client connections are interest only, meaning they'll only send you something if you're interested. But every time you publish in a client, it always goes to the nearest connected server and then is processed there. Leaf nodes will never send data either direction unless there's explicit interest. So I'll do uh, just start up again with just uh, without the DB. 
Um, and now when I go and I say A, right, we still get the same thing that we saw above, except I have, of course, a new message and things like that. But now B is going to actually be scoped to the OSCON account in NGS, okay? So I haven't done anything. I have had set five sessions, but nothing in the last four hours, last 24 hours. I've done a little bit of stuff because I was playing with this demo last night. So again, at the, the highest level, what I think we're showing, in, in my opinion, which is fairly straightforward to look at, is the ability to do things that most technologies just simply can't do yet. Or they can do it, but it's extremely complex from a configuration, monitoring, management, keeping the lights on perspective, which is we have a shared utility that has a certain security domain and an operator, you know, Synadia, let's say, in this counts for NGS. I then decided on my own to extend that utility network that's global, all cloud providers, all major geos, and run my own server with my own security domain, even multi-account, right, so that I can actually be mixing and matching. And again, what's happening here, that's, it's very trivial to kind of skip over, but what's happening here is that a message is being presented to my local server that I connect to very quickly with no TLS. It understands that it has to route it because there's interest in this subject inside of my account that's represented by the service account inside of NGS that are running all over the world. The distributed queuing and geo pinning technologies that we have in our global super clusters finds the closest one for my request. It moves from my account, my local account here, to my Derek account in NGS. It crosses an account membrane in a secure fashion into the usage account, which gets a ngs.usage.derek uh, request. It says, oh, Derek wants his usage for the last 24 hours puts that all together and simply responds to the reply subject and it makes it all the way back to here. And so being able to depend on that type of a technology, the ability to mix and match shared utility SaaS type offerings with owned and operated um, type deployments, um, totally location dependent, totally secure, um, you know, being able to be as agile as you need to be with the applications that you're trying to do, uh, we just think it's incredibly powerful. And so, we like it. We, we think it's a, a great uh, addition to the network topology type stuff um, that we see. And um, yeah, we're, we're really excited about it. So I'll go back now to um, demo. We'll just do a Q&A um, type scenario and I'll see if I can find any uh, questions if anyone has any. Um, if not, we can uh, catch up with some space and, and uh, time and move on. I don't see any questions yet in the Q&A. If anybody has any questions, uh, use your Q&A button on your Zoom browser. And we can obviously um, answer these on the Slack channels as people try to get their feet wet. Um, but it's, it's incredibly powerful, but so approachable. And, and from the things that I've seen out there, just drop dead simple uh, to configure and to operate. And just like the core of, of Nat's technology from um, all of the topology and topology connections that they self-heal themselves and they reassemble themselves, they also gossip that information back and forth to clients and leaf nodes are no different, right? So if all of a sudden the server that I was connected to inside of NGS went away, the system would automatically try to reheal itself, re-solicit the connection, rehook it all up. All of that in the background, you don't have to worry about it. Um, so yeah, it's pretty cool. Uh, so Thomas says, how much of Jetstream preview works over leaf nodes? Um, that's a great question. And believe it or not, even though Jetstream is by design underneath the covers, um, account, uh, multi-account aware, NATS 2.0 aware, and we've actually just put in the configuration for um, things, the way we started rolling out at the beginning was, you would run a server just with a global account and say minus J JS. As a matter of fact, the server I was just running is a Jetstream server. So I could show you that if, if you want, or we could wait till later. Um, and so what happens is that Jetstream is enabled for the global account, but again, it's connected into NGS on my behalf inside of the Derek account, which means that now globally on NGS, my account now has Jetstream enabled being powered by this leaf node. And what you can imagine, if you remember leaf nodes being hubs and spokes, um, we, we might be um, overusing this, but we think it's very, very powerful, which is you can utilize these leaf nodes that are run JS just to be extensions to your storage. So when we release Jetstream clustered, right, you'll be able to have a core cluster or core super cluster 
and it might have some storage resources and memory resources that it's it's pooling between all the servers for Jetstream based on all the accounts that are that are trying to access it. Um, but let's say you know Kyle, who I can see on the on the uh, the Zoom gallery, says I need more. I, I want to have more disk storage. I want to add you know a petabyte of, of storage. Instead of having have to change that core cluster or core super cluster, you can actually extend this and say, no, we're just going to run a plain leaf node, no accounts, nothing crazy except that remote solicitation into our core cluster that binds the Kyle's account. And we put a petabyte of, of disk and SSD or flash uh, memory underneath of it. And now all of a sudden, Kyle's account has a petabyte more of disk space than everyone else. So the, we're, we're using both of them. They're, they're they're mutually exclusive technologies, but they are helping each other quite, quite a bit. Um, so we have another one that's a little bit longer. Uh, so I think the general gist of this question is, is do we understand the concept um, at a level that could enable things like GDPR? And the answer is yes. So at, at the beginning presentation where I was doing the welcome, I said location independence mostly. Uh, and, and John, I'll read your uh, question more once uh, um, we, we move to the next presenter and I'll, I'll put some more detail in there, but I just skimmed it very quickly. Um, but we do have the ability to very cognizantly understand permissions uh, within accounts and users of you know, what you're allowed to send to and receive from. Uh, Alberto was demonstrating that with WebSocket. But we also have the notion of where are you allowed to connect from? What, times can you connect from, things like that. And so we don't have package solutions for it, but we think we have all of the pieces similar to how we laid the groundwork for WebSockets coming to fruition with what we think is a very compelling um, solution. Uh, we have the same thing for this, and this is very top of mind for us. A lot of the team members are thinking about um, data ownership and, and the ability to control where that data moves, either based on which is, to be frank, blunt instruments. GDPR and the California initiative around data privacy are very blunt, but we don't think it's going away, right? And we do believe that it's going to continue to evolve. Um, and so we're not going to be going backwards. We're going to be going forwards where we're going to have more refined technologies that allow people to control um, data that they generate, right? And so we are very um, trying to be on top of that and think through that. And so again, I'll, I'll respond uh, uh, directly to your thing as well. Um, also, the other way, have Jetstream only in the leaf. Yes, so Thomas, that's a matter of fact how we run it today. So if I ran uh, a server, which I can show you uh, either now or later on in the day, uh, the exact same leaf node where I said, if I just put a minus JS on the end, it would spin up you know, um, Jetstream locally on my server using all of my resources on this machine, but it would be presented to any user in the Derek account on NGS from any connection worldwide, any cloud provider, any geo. So yeah, we can definitely do uh, the opposite. Thank you. Uh, I'll let uh, Ginger take back over and we can move on, but uh, play, with, play with leaf nodes. We think they're gonna be an amazing addition to the ability to construct arbitrary topologies and be able to scale them and, and modify them without having to touch the endpoint applications. They can continue to exist uh, because again, it's just Nats. It's just a client connection and it doesn't matter if it's connecting to a route server, a leaf node server, a supercluster server, it all works exactly the same. So thank you.